Good evening and welcome to tonight's shear. Tonight is the uh, Sunday of before Rosh Hashanah of Tafshim Pei Dalit. Thinking for next, obviously, the next um, Sunday night there will not be a shear. It's in still Rosh Hashanah. I was considering of doing a shear the f following Thursday, the Thursday before Shabbos Shuvah. Uh, that we should help them and have what to say and to share it. Okay, let's go to our Shia. So we have our first question. So last Friday, a woman had already benched licht and she looks around in her kitchen and she realizes She looks around in the kitchen and she realizes that she had not put the cholent up. And so the question is, could she now place the cholent on the hot plate? The hot plate is plugged in. So to place the cholent on the hot plate would be a dindera bonon. Now, generally, we say that you are allowed to do um, various isure de rabbonon are permitted by Ashmoshes, so Hatmona taking Meiser, um, uh, etc. There are things which one is permitted to do by Ashmoshes. So, what's the story with having bench licht? Is it now there are different levels in Kabbalah Shabbos? There's a level which is a basic Kabbalah Shabbos, but not the full Itzumer Shalyoim. At that level, you are still allowed to do those like Hatmona or Thomas um, the etc. Once there's a full Kabbalah Shabbos, so the more it says in Poskim, a few David Mairu. As a full Kabbalah Shabbos, so after that, you're not allowed to do even Isra de Rabbonon. Question is, what is the definition of Kabbalah Shabbos of when a woman benches Licht? So this is not explicit in the Alter Rebbe's Shukhan Aruch, but we do have here the Kuntus Achren um, of in the Alter Rebbe's Shukhan Aruch Simre Samach Aleph, and this is discussed in the Ksos HaShulchan. So the Ksos HaShulchan is in Simen Ayavov, Ha'ara Yud Aleph, so let's read, let's read that inside. So he has to come, I'm sure, so I'm explaining what is the dilemma here. Is it a full Kabbalah Shabbos or only a basic Kabbalah Shabbos. So he writes, a Kabbalah Shabbos, that a woman is in the Kabbalah through Hadlokas Neiris, Havi Kabbalah Itzume Shalyoim. This is considered a full-blown Kabbalah Shabbos. The proof to this is that a, that a woman, after she's been licht, she's not allowed to do mincha. If it was just Kabbalah Toys for Shabbos, then, which is not as strict, then she should have been allowed to do mincha. And then he gives a clear, he says, He quotes the Ran, He says, 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 He once that the the last thing on Erev Shabbos is listed as lighting candles, because after that, so he says the last one also lahatmin, you wouldn't be allowed to certainly not allowed to like Hanukkah candles, but even to do something which is the Rabbonon. So this is the Alter Rebbe substantiates that when a woman is with Kabbal Shabbos, so it becomes its Sumer Shalyim, and she's not allowed to. Do even Asa Drabba, so which is becomes like a very interesting because you have Bain Hashmoshes, which is Sophic Deraisa, and you are allowed to do Hatman. By contrast, it's before it's before sunset, but you voluntarily accepted Shabbos, and at that stage, you are not allowed to. So, it's your voluntary acceptance of Shabbos, it's Umesh is stricter. Than the Sophic Deraisa, which is beyond your control. Okay. 
let's move on to the next question. So that was the, what I would like to finish off on this. She was not allowed to, she didn't, she wasn't, wouldn't be allowed to put the food onto the blech, onto the hot plate, but it would have been permitted to ask another person, either a goy or a yid who hasn't been a Kabbal Shabbos, you're on the street and see someone come in, can you do me a favor, put it on, and you have to tell them clearly, uh, so long as it's not doing it personally, it's beyond your immediate person, that would have been permitted. It's good to know these things because, and that's been for talking, talking about Ben Hashemoshes, yeah? Had it been, had it changed, he realized this uh, half an hour, three quarters of an hour later, then that that license to ask a guy to put it on, etc., wouldn't have been applicable. So here we're looking at the Minhag of, well, on, on Rosh Hashanah during Musaf once each day and four times on Yom Kippur at Musaf. So there's a Minhag of everyone kneeling down and bending down all the way till the head is touching the floor. So here we have a note in Sefer Hamin Hogim, the bottom of the, of the uh, screen. For Koyrim, A, we're not noyag like those who are medactic, where those are particular to put down a cloth or similar, if it's a ritzpas kroshim, if it's a wooden floor. If it's a, a stone floor, he refers us to Shukhan Oruch, Ayrachayim Simen Kuflamid Allah. Our question here is what's the story about linoleum, ceramic, Okay, granite, um, uh, marble. So we're going to go through those various things. But first, the the, the Sefer Hamin Hogim refers us to the Shuchanor Sivan Kuf Aleph Lamed Aleph, which talks about Tachm, where it says that one would not be allowed to lipoil al Puneim. One should not prostrate oneself totally, even if there's no ever maskis. So. Let's read the Mishnah Brura. Even if there's no stone floor, still one shouldn't prostrate oneself totally. If there is a stone floor, then it's stricter. Then even a, a kneeling without fully prostrating would also be also. So we've got here, on the one hand, there's, there's a couple of issues here. One one thing is about whether it's appropriate bechlal for one to prostrate oneself, and then there is something here about concern because the Torah says we shouldn't prostrate ourselves on an, on a stone be'artzchem outside the base hamikdash. So what we're seeing here is that if it's um, if it's not a stone floor, then bowing is permitted, but not prostrating oneself. Um, if it's a stone floor, even kido, which is not not, not a, a full bowing, also shouldn't be done. Um, and that's after a, a stone floor. If it's a brick floor, Mr. Burr says it's okay, because the Torah says the word even, even maskis, and a brick is not an even, as it says, by the building of the Tower of Bovel, that the, the word for brick is leveno, or le even, that is an erzatz stone that doesn't count as a stone right so uh, this is the background which we have here that for a stone floor would be homo now when we our minigokhoirim is not a full prostrating we don't lie flat it's a it's bowing um with your head down to the floor but it's not fully prostrating nevertheless if it's a stone floor that's not okay and that's the background of the minhag of uh, putting down a cloth. Now, in the Mata Ephraim, and in turn in the Kitsa Shukhanaro, it's written to do to cover even a wooden floor, etc. That's the seems to be the broader minhag. So in many communities, they will always put down a cloth, even if it's not a stone floor. And that's the Khirush and the Sefer Hamin Hogim that we're not particular about that if it's a wooden floor, and for that matter, if it's a, a lino, linoleum floor, 
or for that matter, if it is covered with ceramic tiles, again, ceramic tiles are basically bricks made of, of, of clay, and therefore you don't need to put down a, a cloth. What is a, does become an issue is if it's made of granite, granite um, tiles, which in Israel is very, very popular. They call them the balatot. I don't know where that sounds Arabic to me. But that, there, there would be an a issue. That's what the contemporary poskim are saying, that if it's made from granite is a composite of many small stones, there they say you should consider it the issue of, of bowing on stone. And similarly, a marble floor would be also necessary to, to put a down a half sick min hadin. And the Hemshir he brings from the Mati Ephraim about even on a carpet to put a shmata on top of a carpet, etc. So that's not our minic, yeah? So we're not particularly in, uh, so if you've got a wooden floor uh, or a lino floor, etc., there's no need to put down uh, a piece of cloth. Um, just as one who <laughs> it might sound a bit uh, funny to you, uh, a couple of years ago, they were giving out in the shuls on um, these these cloth, these uh, sheets of plastic to put down. What bothered me was in the corner there was a little sponsored ad by a local phone company or something. And I just want to throw in, there is a lotion, Ein Koirim Bishtare Hadiatis. You shouldn't be reading ads on uh, Rosh Hashanah or Yom, Yom, Yom Tov. I'm just playing on the words of Koirim, as in with a kuf or Koirim with a kof. You shouldn't do Koirim on Shtare Hadiatis. You shouldn't be bowing down on uh, advertisement papers. They, sh they shouldn't be in the show, really. Uh, commercial ads don't belong in a place of tefillah. But that's uh, okay. Coming back, so now we're going on. We're going on to the next next uh, mm -hmm. question. It's coming up, uh, same Gedalia, and every, and every fast day, the we say Anein which one Esra. The the Chidim as individuals in our quiet Shmon Esra, we only say Aneinu at Mincha, and we incorporate it in the Brach of Shemei at Tefillah. Whereas the Chazan says Aneinu as a separate bracha, in other words, there are 20 brachas that morning or afternoon, he says that both at Shachas at Mincha. Now, what happens if there was a, a sleepiness in the rest of the show and no one realized that the Chazan missed Aneinu? Okay, if someone realized before Shemeyat Tefillah, so then the Chazan will incorporate it in Shemeyat Tefillah. What happens if the sleepiness was so much that they came already to the pasture me at Oops, middle of Moidim. So what do we do now? So I'm going to read first the Morgan Avraham, which is the top of the screen, and then we'll go down to the various other sources. Says the Marshal. That you say Aneinu as a freestanding brocha straight after Bashom. Now, he gives a reference. This is another Mogadav Rom talking. Look in Simon. Now, this is Mogadav Rom in Kufiud Tes, in Dinim of Shachris Shalchoyl. But he refers us to the tour in Tovko Samachay, which is the Dinim of Tanis. The Yesh Oirmin, that even a Yochit should say Aneinu as a 20th brocha after Bashom. And he, indeed, that we don't follow that opinion, the Yochit, but a Yochit will not say Aneinu as a 20th bracha after Basholim, at least Bashat, Bashliach Tzibu, one can rely on that because it's not as if out of sequence, because the sequence is finished. Okay, so this is the Morgan of Rome, quoting Mashal, if Aneinu was forget, forgotten at Shemei Atafilo, it is said as a follow on. Straight after Hamvor Chazam Yisrael Bar Shalom, that's the Mash, that's the Mogen Avrom, and here the Alter Rebbe is quoting the same halacha. Vimshocha gam b'shemei atfilo, oim ra brocha bifne atzmoi, achar Bar Shalom. 
that you say it as a, as a standalone bracha, which bepashtus means with Baruch Ato Hashem, Mo'ayin Alam Yisrael Beis Tzad. That's bepashtus how you read this. Bracha Bifnei Atzmi. Whereas when you read the Kitz of Shechon Aruch, so then, in Simon Chof, in the name of Shacharis, he talks about the Anenu. Uh, it belongs in between Gayel Yisrael and Rafi Chayle. And then he says, if you forgot to say it, then you included Shemayat Philo. Then he says, then if you forgot it there too, Oimro Achasim at Philo, Beloi Chasimo, that you don't say Baruch Atu Hashem at the end. So this is now different than what we've been saying till now. Yeah? Till now we've been saying Baruch Atu Hashem. And now we say Beloi Chasimo. That's what the Kitzah writes. Now I've mentioned several times that the Kitzah Shechon is a, um, has three sources for the Alter Rebbe Shechon the Chaya Odom, and the Derech HaChayim. Those are his, usually you can find what he writes in one of those sources, at least in the uh, Chaim section. So now let's take a look at the Derech HaChaim. Derech HaChaim was written by Rabbi Yaakov of Lisa, um, I believe contemporary of the Alter Rebbe. And it was published, it became a very popular sefer. Uh, it was a precursor to the Kitzvah Shechonaro. And Avram David Lavut, when he published the Torah Ursida, he published together with it the Shar HaKairo. He also published together with it, in the same volume, he published Sidur Der HaChayim. But a Chosid he was. And therefore, he, he did it, made his business, that's probably why he did it, to have a comparative column in the Der HaChayim, wherever is at variance with the Alter Rebbe. So he pre-publishes Der HaChayim im Nesiv HaChayim. So now what we have here is the uh, Der HaChayim. He's saying, if you've forgotten Shemei Philo, say it another as a separate bracha, B'loi Chasimo, before L'chayim Etzer. B'loi and you don't just it's not inserted between Shemet Phil and Itse. On this point, where he says, without a chasimo, the Rabbi Rom David Lavud writes that the Alter Rebbe says, Oim Rabbocha Bifne Atzmo, Acha So he's, he's, and what he's trying to say is that you say it with a chasim. So, and this is also Rabbi Chaim Noe of much more recent uh, times, going back 70 years ago. So he, in the Luach Kol Chabad, he also writes, Shochach Gam Shom, if you forgot to say, at Aneinu, even in Shemei Atfilo, Oim Rab Rocha Bifnei Atzvei, Achar Sim Sholem, which Rocha Bifnei Atzvei means with Hashem's name at the end. So what I my take away from this is that the Kitzur Shechon which was recently reprinted with Psokim of the Alter Rebbe, included with, with in Hagi Chabad, this I believe is falling short of what the mission statement of that sefer, because to say that just to say Achav Asholim, that's not enough. It should say that, that the Alter Rebbe says you should say you should uh, uh, say the as a bracha bifnei atzvoi, which means uh, with, with with the chasimo. Okay, so hopefully in the next edition that will be corrected. So the next question is, someone asked, when you do Nitya Shadayim, is it necessary to see the chalas of the table that they are on? Now, the question didn't include whether he's talking about the Shabbos and you're talking about washing Nitya Shadayim after Kiddush or just Nitya Shadayim on a weekday, nothing to do with Kiddush. And this is a very common thing by you come to a mitzvah, a chasana. So the washing facilities are often quite far from where you are going to eat. So I know in America it used to be very popular that the caterers would put a tray of cubes of hamoitzi near the washing station. 
I don't remember whether they still do it, but let's read the halacha as it is in Alter Rebbe Shukunaruch in Simon Kuf Samavavol. Now, there is, everyone knows the Russian Agamora, take care for the Lintilas Yadai in Brocha. Sholish Tkifo is saying there are three things which should be next to one another. Somoch, take care for the Gulot Filo, take care for the Smicha Shchito, and take care for the Lintilas Yadai in Brocha. In the, that phrase, take it until she die in brocha, there are two ways of learning. Does it refer to maim achroinim, or does it refer to maim rishoinim? Again, the bro, when it says take it until she die in brocha, which until she die does it mean, and which brocha does it mean? So this is what he says. Yes, oimrim. And also with the maim or rishoinim, one should also be particular, like with maim achroin, because in the Gemara it says that one who succeeds. In having the Tils Yadayim close to the Brocha, he won't be harmed in that meal. And that's only logical to apply for the washing before the meal. Because to say that at the end, he's already finished his meal and he's washing my Tils my Machronim, right before benching, or he won't be harmed from that meal. The meal is over. He's eaten already. It's unlikely you're talking about he'll, you know, it'll be a, a reaction after he's eaten. Therefore, there's this uh, this uh, approach that that also by 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 there should also not be a, a a unnecessary interval between the washing and hamoitzi. So let's read. Therefore, the fichor. Therefore, one should be careful not to be mafsik. Afilu b'shehiyo kedei hiluch chov beis amo. I shouldn't have an interval, even the amount of time it takes to walk 22 amas, because that is considered a hefsik. That amount of time is a hefsik, even if you're sitting put. The source of the 22 amas has got to do with the Beis Hamikdash, where you'd have a case where someone brought a korban who cannot enter the Beis Hamikdash, cannot enter the Azar, as he's standing by, he or she is standing by the gate. And then, till the point where they are able to shecht it, something like that, has got to do with from the gates. Got sh- as a sister, all 20, 11 amas. As it's quite 12, 11 amas. So it's 22 amas until the Mokim Ashkito. So that's the source of Chav Beis Amo. So one shouldn't make a pause, unnecessary, unnecessary pause, more than, or as much as the amount of time it takes to, to uh, 22, uh, 22 amas. In the bracket, he says, if you walk from one house to another, that's considered a hefsuk, even if it's a little bit of walking. We've discussed this a few times, that shine mokim is a hefsuk. Then he says, So really what we're seeing here is three levels. There's a hefsuk, even the, a minimum, a minimal hefsuk shouldn't be done. If it's a hefsik litsoirich, but not litsoirich eating, it's litsoirich for something else, then you want to close the curtains, let's say. I don't know. One should, why? Because you need some privacy when you're eating. Good. That is litsoirich. But it shouldn't be a pause of more than the amount of time it takes to walk 22 hours. That's a hefsik litsoirich, but not litsoirich achil. Then they have a hefsik litsoirich achil. Now let's read that inside carefully. I, I would like to address this carefully because, as, as I say, by, by public functions, the chastas, etc., it's it's very inagaya. If the pause is be- related to the meal, the needs of the meal, that's not called a hefsik. I feel a bit hamoitzi la'achila. Even between the brocha of hamoitzi and eating the bread, kosher kei benatila la'amoitzi, much more so between the washing for bread and the subsequent brocha of hamoitzi. The kosher kei. The pause from when you when, when, which is needed for drying your hands and the walking from the washing station till where you're eating, where you're going to be sitting, that's not a call a hefsik. So even walking a longer distance. From the washing station till where you are eating is also not a hefsi because it's soyrechachilo. 
that walking is needed to get to your to, rather than having to stand and eat somewhere in the corridor, which is not exactly uh, uh, gentlemanly. Right, Elo shel chatchilot zoch little yod of so much walking masudim efshe. One should wash as close as possible to where you're dining, uh, etc. And Baruch Hashem, in many Hamish halls, they have installed sinks inside the room rather than having to go go a, a distance. Akoponim. So, is there a question of shinui mokrim between ham netilo and hamoitzi? So there is a preference to wash close by, but if you are washing in one room and going to another room, that's not a problem. If that's necessary, that's okay. Personally, I sometimes well, I, I would I'm going to a house or something and I'm washing by the washing station, which is quite a distance. So I'll take with a couple of tissues and keep on wiping my hands until I come to my place. In this way, I've kind of mi minimized the hefsek between... Uh, now, if next time you go to Hasna and you see some tissues under the table, you know who to blame. Okay. Um, now, that was between the Tishadayim and Hamoitzi. Then with the question about between Kiddush and Hamoitzi. And here's a different issue. There is a deen of Kiddush has to be Bimokim Suda. Now, is it justified to leave the place and you're going to come back again? And in between, you've, in, the, you've, you've broken the Kiddush B'mokim Suda sequence. That's the, this is now in a separate concern. And this is discussed in Sporim. And what I have here is a quote from the Sefer Kitzah Halochus Mishchanor Chadmoazokim. This is written by Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz, who lives in Rishon Lutzion published about 30 years ago, very, very good safer, perhaps a bit more, 40 years ago, um, a very good safer, a digest of Hilchas, uh, of Shukhan Aruch, Hilchas Shabbos, from the beginning of Shabbos until Havdalah. So he writes there that the when you go out of the room, it's very common to go out of the dining room to the kitchen, let's say, which is a different room, but you have every intention of coming straight back, that is not considered shinu yimoku. Therefore, you are allowed to leave the dining room in order to wash in uh, the other room and then come back right away. Although the Mogna Avram and Shnath Rebbe write that going out between Kiddush and Hamuitzi is a problem, possibly there is talking about um, where there's that he did not have intention to eat right away. When the intention is to eat there right away, that the going out of the room momentarily is not a problem. So I hope that's made get given a bit of clarity. The pause is not a problem. Now, having said that, it is it would be correct, as you see, to to minimize the amount of interval. Therefore, when we wash into a dime and everyone's waiting for uh, for the balabais to make hamoitzi, it would be correct for the Bnei Hamishpocha to also, Bezrizis, to wash as soon as, as they can so that there shouldn't be unnecessary waiting around um, between between a Tzirsudayim and hamoitzi. Let's move on. So what's our so we'll skip something. Number five. Okay. And number five was a question. I don't have anything on the screen. Uh, a Jew wishes to buy an apartment. This is somewhere in, in Russia. And uh, his small town. There's a new development there of apartment building and uh, apartment buildings. And he wants to buy. He's got the money for Hashem. He wants to buy an apartment. But the rumor has it that that site used to be a cemetery. So, the, of course, the first question is, is he a coin? And the answer is, no, he's not a coin. So, is there any issue? Now, generally, a mace is also bahanor. We're not allowed to have benefit from a mace. Well, probably also, possibly applies to going. You may remember we had once a discussion about using bone for uh, some kind of dental implant and bone, bone being taken from a dead uh, body. So, it's, it's, that's, there is an issue of a mace is also bahanor. Does that mean the grounds become sacred? Does that mean that after uh, the beam, 
dug over, etc. That is much less. So I, I wasn't so confident about this. I did a bit of a search, and I found in the rather contemporary sefer called Mishnah Halochas from Rabbi Menashe Klein, the, the Rabbi Boruch Oberlander Zolazangezund, who is the Shliach and Rov in Budapest. So he had been asked about. He uh, he was asked by a developer by uh, who wanted who wanted the, the city Budapest or whatever it was had land which had been used for burial, and now they had put it up for sale for development. Now, I'm not dealing now with the morals of doing so. They had decided that this land is available for development, and the Jewish uh, contractor, uh, developer, was asking whether it's legitimate. And Rav Klein, in his shuva, goes through a lot of discussion. Is it? Do we have to worry that there might be some Jews there who are, are Jewish but, um, remains there? Possibly, on the other hand, could be that the remains have disintegrated to the point that there's nothing left there. He goes to the whole back and forth. His bar, his end, his end um, conclusion is that basically it is okay, but as an extra, the buyer, the contractor, or whatever, the developer, should uh, stipulate with the city authorities that they should plow over the, the land before purchase happens. So they, they, they will destroy any trace of visible trace of the cemetery, and then he will be. So I, I just see this with Kalva If there he's even allowing to buy a, a plot and have it, uh, which they are going to first plow over for sure once there has been already the building has been built. There shouldn't be any question of his Hanoi on the land um, built over it. It's just uh, he, he won't be able to have Koyanim over for lunch. Okay. That, does, that doesn't seem to be the top of his priorities at the moment. Okay, this might be a bit of a surprise <clears throat> about rolling. <clears throat> someone brought this to my attention about rolling up a beard on Shabbos. Now, I never really thought much of it of it being a problem, but here of Chaim Noe, in his one of his later um, volumes, Ches, he argues. That just like we know that we're not allowed to make plats on Shabbos, and that comes under the issue of boina. So he's asking, when rolling a beard and making it into a some kind of structure, why is that different to boina with, with plats? So that's that's his argument. It should be it should be also to roll a beard on Shabbos, and he doesn't see why should it be different between a man and a woman. Then he says, we can be Malamaz because not everything you do with the hair is called boina. It's only if it's a more widely accepted thing, people make such a kind of structure. But since something which something which is not so common, therefore that wouldn't be called boina. And therefore, that in fact you here, you have here a few uh far a few individuals who roll the beards, he says they're so so few, that doesn't make it into a recognized tikkun so he says because it's not so common therefore it's not called boina that's so again he he argues the first the chayre rolling a beard should be the same as making a plat and therefore should be called boina he says because it's not such a normal thing to do therefore it's not called boina so then he goes all right so he's got a heter for the rolling of the beard but then he says i hear that the people also not enough, they have to roll the beard, they also have to use a horn noddle, they use some kind of uh, hairpin, which women normally use for keeping their tichel on, on, in place. And he says, well, then I have a problem of going out in the street with this, because it's not considered a normal form of dress. Are you doing it in order that the hair should stay in place? But he then he says... <laughs> Since he said that it's not a normal behavior to roll your beard, therefore you can't say that this is a derech novisha. So the head to, uh, to allow you to roll the beard now works against you to say that, that putting the pin is not, is not called derech novisha. So he does make a problem with it. That's how he, he, he remains with a problem. So that's Reb Chaim Noir. Now, on the other hand, we've got here a reference to, um, to the... Uh, Piskei Chuvas, 
and I think it's in Simon Shin Aleph. Shin Shin Aleph, I think Sif Lamed, I don't remember exactly now, but he, he talks about this and he says that it's also permitted to use a pin to keep a, a yarmulke on the stuck to the hair or to keep a tie in place and those who fold their beards, roll up their beards and put a, a, a bobby pin or a, a, an elastic band, hold it. Shapi Yeshlo Hem Al Masha they have uh, authorities upon whom they can rely. So, he, and but then in the footnotes, he actually brings Reb Chaim Noah, who's not okay with it. Which is the whole thing was like for me very, very interesting. Um, you know, you see him. You know, it's all very well for him to say it's on. It's very unusual. I can think of many people who do roll their beards, and um, I know that a lot, a lot of them also use pins. To hold it on the clips to hold them in place, and a prime noise it doesn't 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 uh, doesn't sanction it. But uh, there are others who disagree. Okay, I, I'm not sure how they would answer his his timeless. Time of boy is interesting. So yeah, so he says pinning the cart yamaka to the to the hair that is, we'll say it is quite common, um, but but. Uh, here he makes a whole building of uh, my main concern is how do you get out of the boiner? Why, how can you define why rolling a beard into a roll is different to a plait? I don't think a plait, I always under the under impression that the plait is because they're folded over and there's a whole, a whole structure there. Rolling a beard is, I think, a much simpler um, kaula. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious if someone out there has any further uh, insights on this, but we're going to go on. Okay, so someone writes to me that they read in a, some kind of book that putting challah burning on your stove makes the stove tray. Well, the, we know that the challah is also for us to eat because it belongs to the client. Um, and then this, this book says, put it in the garbage. The bar garbage is burned in any case, so it's going to be burned at the other end. Now, I have not made my done homework on this, whether the garbage in this country ends up in an incinerator. Um, I, I know that there's truckloads of garbage coming out of every street every day, kind of thing. Uh, we'd like to have it more frequently, but this is, the, the amount of garbage that's produced in a metropolis is huge. I have yet to see these massive incinerators with all the smoke going up. I, ha I haven't seen it, so I, I, uh, I might not let me know. I might be missing something. We should be seeing somewhere in the, in the, in the, in the, in the country incinerators burning garbage. I believe they have other ways of, of, of um, disposing of it rather than burning. But even if it, even if they do, even if they do, so now. We have here from the Alter Rebbe Shukunaro, I think it's Simitophical Vov in in Hechaz Yom Tov. He says that if you take Chala, you're allowed to make a dough on Yom Tov. You take Chala, don't burn the piece of Chala on Yom Tov. Afal pi sheyesh mitzvahs ase bisrei fosso. There's a mitzvah in Hatayra to burn Chala. Chala has become tome. And inedible, there's a mitzvah in a Torah to burn it. Why can't you burn it on Yom Tov? The answer is because Yom Tov is a Asif So although there's a mitzvah to burn the Chala, but the, that doesn't override the mitzvah of, of Yom Tov or not doing Malacha unnecessary for Yom Tov. But what we're seeing here is there's a mitzvah in a Torah of burning Chala. Therefore, if it's a mitzvah, you shouldn't really be putting it, giving it to the guy to do. You should be doing it yourself. Now, just to su get, get support, as you see, I always like to get co contemporary sporum. There's a, a, a very nice safer called Hakashros from our Rabbi Fuchs. And he writes that it's customary to singe the chala on the, to burn the chala on the stove or to put it inside the oven not at the same time where things are baking. But uh, there's no question of anything becoming trafed up when you put it on the burner on top. 
because it's 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 being burnt. You know, how do you cast a thing by burning? It's, I don't see how you make things strafe by burning. It's being burnt, so it's, there's not going to be any residue. I don't see that as a problem. Putting it in the oven it has to be at a time when there's no no food baking, because otherwise the taste flavor from the fowler could be shared with uh, with the food when that would be an issue. Now, as I was thinking about this, oh, you're saying that there's a mitzvah to burn challah. So why don't we say a bracha, shekachon of a mitzvah, lisrei fesakadoshim. I was intrigued. Why is there no, if it's if it is a mitzvah to burn challah, why don't we say a bracha on doing so? So, I, I searched on the Yetzar HaChachman and it brought me to this uh, volume, some kind of journal, and where this question is asked. And actually there's a machlokas, whether this idea which the Alter Rebbe says, it's a mitzvah to burn, so it's not according to all Rishonim, but to some Rishonim, it's a mitzvah to get it out of trouble. But it doesn't have to be dafka burnt. Whereas, that seems to be Rashi's opinion, whereas Toysus says it's a mitzvah taka to burn it. But then it's the why, the why no brocha? So here, Rav Moshe Feinstein in Igres Moshe addresses this, and he says a very nice swara. When you do a mitzvah in the right way, you make a brocha. But here, what happened? You were mafrish chalo. You should have given it to the koyin. But became it's tome. Then the koyin's tome. The koyin can't eat it. So unfortunately, because we can't deal with it in the proper way. Therefore, we're going to have to burn it. Well, that's not really the ideal of the mitzvah. And therefore, burning kodshim, shenifsalu, is not, is not the kind of thing which you make a bracha on. It's not, it's not the ideal way of doing the mitzvah. And therefore, it doesn't deserve to make a bracha. That's Moshe's um, uh, svara. Uh, I, I don't have any, any raya one way or the other, but I, I think it's a very nice svara. Right. Um, so here was a question, question number eight. So a chazan, this is Beis Chabad, a shliach, and he's often down at the Omid, and he, usually they have a minion, came to Yeshtaba, he, he looked around, he couldn't see, he only saw nine people, so he went on straight into Yetzirah, and right after he said, and then some you know, no, 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 there's a, there's somewhere, someone had been sitting like behind a column or something. The pearl, there was someone there, he didn't notice. So there were 10 people. So he says what he did before Hameir Loretz. So I said, Kaddish and Bochum. And he asked me, did I do the right thing? So at first I, I thought he did the wrong thing, but after upon reflection, I think he was right. The reason being, the reason being that truthfully, the whole union of interrupting in the middle of Sukhir Zimra or Vichas uh, Krishma for Gloria Shabakadusha is not discussed in the Gemara. In Gemara, it talks about. Mishnah, you're not to interrupt in the middle of Pirchus Krishna to greet someone out of fear, out of uh, respect. And Poskim, after the Gemorrahs, to explain that it cannot be that should be less than COVID. Therefore, when there's a call to interrupt for Kavod Shamayim to, to the glory of Hashem, then you 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 you'll, you'll be mafsi. Okay, that's that's the the uh, basis of it. So just for example, um, you know, if a person is called up to the Torah and is middle of Vichas Krishna, so he goes up. All right. So it's, uh, the advice is that he doesn't read along with the Balkhair. Rely on the Rosh, the whatever they that you rely whatever you rely on on the on the reading of the Balkhair. But what happens, and this is from Mr. Brura, this is Simma Samach Vov in Hichas Krishna. If there's a Sevatoyer now on the table, on the Bima, and there's no one else capable to read, to lane, and you are in the middle of Hichas Krishna, she says, absolutely, you should be Mavsik. 
you should go over a lane. You should try to finish off a section where you're, you're in the middle of, and also don't be the garbai to call up people um, by name. So that can be delegated. But you do if you interrupt, so you're you are on you, you you are capable, and therefore you rise to address the need of the tzibur, even though you are middle of yichus kishma. So now, what happened in our case, that the yishtabach was said, the minyan was there. There's a need to say yishtab the kadesh and borcho. That need was overlooked, and it can be done. So he is now talking is the middle of yichus kishma. But you should still interrupt to say the Kaddish and Baruch Hu. I've mentioned a few times I've got this specialist sefer on mistakes in davening. It's a two-volume set called Shri Yosmi Yavin. And I looked there, and this mistake doesn't come up. What it does come up is that was a case where the Chazan finished he forgot to say Kaddish. And so, does he say Kaddish now? He, he skipped it. And um, he quotes from Rabbi Yashif that he is obliged to say Kaddish. Um, I believe it. So, um, and, and he says a word that that's the idea of a shliach, a shliach tzibur. A shliach tzibur, like every shliach, is there for the benefit, not for the detriment of those who appointed him. Therefore, he had... He, He's authorized to say Kaddish. He's not authorized to skip Kaddish for them. He's not, he's not authorized to deprive the Tzibur of their Kaddish. And therefore, it has to be said. and He, he should say it. Okay. Um, that's so much for the various Shadows um, of this past week. I wanted to go back to the business of the gap in the parasha of Shema in the Tefillin. Now, I recalled um, but well, it wasn't so clear about this. Now, according to the Alter Rebbe, it seems to be quite clear that this is lechatchila um, permitted to have. Yeah, the Alter Rebbe talks about having a gap of nine letters, but it seems to be quite clear from various sofrim, etc., that it doesn't mean dafkenai can be more than nine letters, and it's still called a stuma because v'hoyim uh, shamoya is inset. That's the Alter Rebbe's position. If you want to do more reading about this, I'm sure I didn't manage to find out, to find before last year, there is a Sefer by Ribera Levin. So if you can see on the screen, um, it's called Shiure Aloha Lamaisa. So volume Aleph. So there he's got several pages exploring and explaining the Alter Rebbe's Shitta um, which way, uh, how to do the spaces in the parshas of Shema and Vahoyim Shemoya, and the difference between the space um, in in a, in a in Tefillin and the space in Mezuzah. I suspect because in the Mezuzah they are in the same scroll and what one falling straight after the other, um, so that makes the difference. But okay, that's but he he does discuss it in great detail. It's about, it's, not, it's about five pages. Um, okay, so you can read it over there. So let's um, try to correct what I said last week, where I'd said that um, this is... It's, my, main, my impression was it's Kosher B'dieved, but not Lachat Chila. That was true according to other poskim, but according to the Alter Rebbe, this seems to be uh, a, the Lachat Chila way of doing it. Okay, um, what else do we have? So... Also from last week, so there had been this discussion about a person who was very limited for time before Mincha about saying Ktoris after Davni, or saying Ktoris before the Zman. So someone, one of our listeners by the same name of um, a Mr. Rabbi Waxer from New York, I believe, tells us that when he got married, Zalman Shimon Dvorkin was the Rov, and Rabbi Zalm Shimon had told him as a chosen he should say Ktoiris before the half hour, and then right from the half hour he should start davening Mincha. Possibly Rabbi Zalm Shimon felt that this chosen needed to have more time to get through Mincha in time for the chosen. I don't know the details. But anyway, that's just an extra source. And I mentioned last time, I was told that the Rebbe, when the Rebbe would give out dollars, 
So they would do Mincha, start Ashrei, bang on time, which would mean that Ketorius had been said earlier. Fine. So then someone had um, asked me, what's this? Um, generally, we don't encourage skipping stuff in order to catch up with the minion. Now, that, that's absolutely true. There is a simon in, there's in a din in Shukhan Aruch, if a person comes late, what they can skip um, in Pesukhi de Zimra, etc., in order to catch up with a minion. And yet, there is in the Meforshim, um, they may buy hate, they bring from the Arizal that one should dive in Allah Seda. So here you have this dilemma. A person has come late, should he skip to catch up the minion, or should he uh, daven al there, even though it means he's going to miss davening with the minion? And the general trend in Lubavitch has been to take the that and this couple of letters of the Rebbe, there's a letter of the Rebbe to Rabbi Dubov, who was a mashgiach in yeshiva in Manchester, and he saw that Bachrim sometimes would come late, and if he would tell them yeah, so he could, he could tell them to skip. He didn't, he didn't know what to do. And the Rebbe tells him, and he quotes, the Rebbe refers to a sefer called Shari Tfilo, which is written by someone called Rikea Hasfar, there's a sefer printed in Livorno. Um, and the Rebbe refers to that sefer, who lists, and looked it up last night, he lists 91, 91 poskim, who tell us that one should skip to in order to catch up, to be able to dive in with a minion. And the Rebbe says, despite that, but he's worried about what's going to happen the next day. The Bocha knows that he can skip to catch up, but that's going to become a habit. He'll be, he'll come late and, and skip. So the Rebbe doesn't doesn't embrace that approach. So the question is, what do you do? All right. Is there a difference? This is really what the question was. Is there a difference in skipping Haluka and Oz Yashir or skipping uh, from foreign, as we call it in Yiddish, skipping Ketoyre, skipping Al-Qaeda, uh, and is there a difference between skipping in the body of Sukkot Zimra or skipping Ketoyre, etc., the, how do you say, the preliminaries? So my response was that I don't have a logical svara to differentiate because the idea is Seder or Olimus, and if you, unless you know your way very, very well, the pastors as I say, the Olamus and the whole, everything till the Haidu is connected to Olam Hasi, and everything after that is uh, whatever, um, is Olam Yitzir, etc. Um, so that one shouldn't be skipping, that's true. I'd like to say, however, that although the Rebbe is talking about, in that letter to Rabbi Dubov, that by skipping, um, it's going to cause more skipping and more skipping, I'd like to just say that, in uh, while I'm looking around in our community, I'd like to encourage people to, uh, you know, people come late and they are uh, still, they have to read this, they have to do that, another thing. And and as a result, they are out of a habit of of, of, of actually being late for the minion. Uh, whether they're needed for the minion or not is, is, is irrelevant. They're missing out at Philip at Sibur because they've got this tardiness, which is, which is a, it's a habit. I know some people are that way inclined and some are not. But actually, to Dafki insist that you have to, everything has to be Allah Seder and, 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 and not to compromise at all in order to dive in the minion, I think that's something which uh, may be taken to the, the other extreme. So uh, I'll leave that point. Um, I think I've said more than I should be saying, but fine. Let's finish off with the question of the uh, riddle, what's the connection between Tisha B'Av and Shemini Atzeris? So, one of our dedicated listeners noticed that, observed that the tune of seems to be similar to somehow seems a, uh, sees a similarity. And that was, he saw it also in some uh, contemporary uh, a book and uh, so that was that was the the beginning of the of the question i mentioned right at, at the time that when i was in yeshiva in to stroll in tofshin lambertes so there's a minute to go to uh to if you're uh, people to, to go to the the, the uh, coastal during halamite 
So I say that Lavash Shalom lived at the time in Fakhabad, I think. Uh, I say he he slept me with, uh, very happy to go with him. We went to the castle, and because the idea of Allah Leah the Regal, Al Tareb actually mentions it in Shukhanoruch, of course, the quoting the Ran, that even Ad Hayyom there's a minig of Ali the Regal that at least Yom Tif, you come to the base of Mikdash, to the Mas, Mokim HaMikdash. So it happened to be that I was Chazan. The minions by the coast, I mean, I was Chazan. And I, for Musaf, so I sang the Losh of the the Nusach, Bnei Vizcho, Kavad, Kilo, Machin, Mikdoshko, Al Nechoinoi. So my Zayda, afterwards, he says, What's this niggin? It's Elitio in the Oreho, Moisho, Batireho, it's almost the same tune of um of of uh from Kinnis from from Tishabo. So since then I try to when I am in a house and I try to steer away from from invoking the Nigan of Elitsi and Valreho in the middle of Cholash Rugalim. But coming back, I'm I'm not so sure whether there is a similar the same tune or not, but there's something more deeper than that. And that's what I'm sharing with you, which the person showed me in this source. Now I'm I'm going to go a little bit over time, but you'll you'll uh, I'm hopefully find it fulfilling. There is someone who's by the name of Reb Moshe Wolfson. He's as uh, old as He's in his nineties. He was on a, a Rosh Hashiva in Torah Vadas in uh, in Tovshim Nem Base. The Rebbe said a sicha, a masim, a mesechas Shabbos, and I and a, a colleague by the name of Levi Yitzchak Yunik, who lives in Montreal. We had a terrace on the kasha which the Rebbe had left open. So we went into the Maskiras and we said we found a couple of Svorim which talk about this, this question which the Rebbe had left open. So Rabbi Grona, all of us, Shalom, he asked us to make a photocopy of the front page of the Sefer as well as the item in the middle of the Sefer which addresses the question which the Rebbe had raised, which we did. So one was a Sefer called... Um, um was it Ben Yahyodo, and the other one was a an Ashkenazi say for uh I remember now. Um by someone called Shapira. At any rate, so um, i I wanted to share with you this word from Ramosha Wolfson. And so I put up on the uh, also the front page of his safer. Okay, so now let's see what he says inside. Really, I'm very impressed with what I can, can see here. I'm, I'm just very briefly, he says in the Jewish calendar, we've got days which are at polar opposites. We've got Shemini uh, Atzeres at one side and Tisha B'Av at the other side. Now he says Shemini Atzeres is actually the pinnacle of the Yom Tovim. You've got the Shal Shregolim, Shonen Yom Kippur, they're all a hachona, preparation for Simchas Shemini Atzeres. And this is like the center of the circle. Now, he's it's, it's, it's very brief here, but he says... It's not called Chag. You now, there's a discussion in the Gemara about Pazar Kasav that Shemini Atzeres is not a Chag Bifne Atzmoy, but he's taking the word Chag as in a circle. That Shemini Atzeres is higher than the circle. All the other Yom Toivim are a Chag, they're like the circle. And Shemini Atzeres is higher than all of them. He gives references to Chsam Soifa, to Ramem Mifano. Um, so Shemini Atzeres is the highest. Of all of these, of the days of the uh, celebration of the year. Now, the Tishabavi, this one I've skipped pieces. Tishabavi is the polar opposite. It's a day of division, it's a day of destruction, a day of darkness. Um, and um, here in Simchaster, you have a Chosen Torah, it's gleaming and shining in happiness. And you have the opposite is a person who's upset and embarrassed and, 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 and dark. And, and, and stooped. So that's the that's the um, spirit of Tishabov. And then he says, we have the Arizal revealed to us that Yirmiyahu is an, a Gilgul of Shleim HaMelech. And the, the night before the inauguration of the Beis HaMikdosh, that was when Shleim HaMelech married the daughter of Parai. And now it says in Novi that Shleim HaMelech overslept and his mother rebuked him. The Muel Melech, the whole thing that he overslept. And why did he oversleep? That was the night after he got married to the daughter of Pare. Now, 
it says in the Gemara that when Shloim Melech got married to Baspa, right? So then it says that Gavriel comes down and he stakes a staff in the sea, and that became a, a, how do you say, a land. Uh, there was a land uh, built up, and that's the Kerach Godel Sharemi. That was the basis of Rome. So Shloim Melech, when he gets married, but there was Unfortunately, then the negative aspect of him getting married with Vasparoi, which was actually the beginning of the Khurban. That was the beginning of the build up of, of the power of Rome, which eventually brought the, 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 the Khurban. So we've got here a, a spiritual, interesting connection of Yirmiyo and Shloyme HaMelech. And so I'm, again, I'm skipping parts of it. So now we have now a different perspective of Tishabov. If Yemiyo is a Gilgul of Shlomo, so then Tishabov, in a sense, is like a Gilgul of Shmina Atzeres. And indeed, it will be transformed, the Simcha. Um, it will be transformed to a Simcha to similar to Shmina Atzeres, as discussed in the beginning of this article. So Tishabov is an exalted day. At the moment, it's with black clothes and covering, but uh, but it's uh, there is a hidden goodness there. And so there, this is, uh, you, you can look up the say for yourself if you want. It's called Emunos Yitecho. It's got several pages, but a fascinating connection between uh, Tishabov and Shmina Atzeres. And so uh, the, that's that's the a deeper answer to the connection. I wish you all a Ksiva Vechasima Toivo, Lashona Toivo Masuko, and um, you should meet in good health. It was she asked to Kano, the base of Middash Shlishi, the Mary Amena Mamsh.